You're listening to A Slice of Therapy with me, Alan Parry. So one of the things that I'm most interested in in my work as a therapist is recovery from trauma. And when I say trauma, there's two there's two ways that you can kind of describe trauma and they're, they're, they're kind of different. So one is an event based trauma. So a really common example of that might be that, I don't know, there was an accident of some sort and ever since you just can't get it out of your mind. So it's that kind of event based trauma. And that interests me too. But the thing that I find myself most interested in, that I think is really underserved when you look at the literature and look what people talk about when when they talk about trauma, is that kind of childhood trauma. So it's not one event. It's the kind of trauma that it's a repeated kind of normality, in quotation marks, It's a sense of the trauma that never stops and is simply just part of your living environment. And that's sometimes referred to as childhood trauma, sometimes referred to as developmental trauma, sometimes referred to as complex trauma, because you can't pin it to a single event. It's something that has happened repeatedly. And so I'm interested in both kinds, but I noticed that It's that complex trauma, that repetitive trauma, that normality of trauma that impact that that kind of impacts my work the most and that I'm most interested in terms of my work as a therapist. And so if you go to my website, you'll notice that there's actually a page there that asks the basic question, you know, did you grow up in a home that felt scary to you? And so if you were to say yes to that, then you're exactly the kind of person that I'm most keen to work with. And because I think about complex trauma quite a lot, and because I notice that it's really underserved in the literature, that people tend to talk about the other kind of trauma much more. What I've kind of come up with is a list, if you like, which are markers of trauma recovery. So I've been trying to get a sense of, you know, how do we know together, me and my client, that change has happened and that it's real lasting change as well. And so I've come up with an initial list. I might start tweaking it and I might change my mind on it, but I wanted to share it with you anyway so I could actually, you know, let this be beneficial as soon as possible. So these are 12 markers of complex trauma, childhood trauma recovery. And so I suppose you could even use this as a checklist so you can kind of note which areas you're struggling with yourself, which areas you've already dealt with and which are still kind of hanging around. But I would say that once we're free of or developmental trauma of that complex trauma, once that's no longer touching our life anymore, then we could tick off these all of these 12 different aspects. So I'll go through them one by one. I won't provide too much explanation because they're mostly self-explanatory, but I'll pause on the odd one. So number one is I can face the trauma and be okay. Because this is a, a common belief that we can't actually look at it. We if if we if we face the trauma, it'll just overwhelm us. And so that actually stops us getting help sometimes. And so that'd be the first one. I can face the trauma and be okay. Number two is I can feel and share my emotions and be okay. Emotions can be really hard to sit with sometimes. And so that ability to feel our emotions, to be able to actually name the emotions. And there are certain emotions that I've spoken about before on the podcast that maybe we feel disallowed from having, you know, not permitted from having. Maybe it wasn't safe, for instance, to show a healthy anger 
or whatever it happens to be, maybe you were ridiculed for appearing sad. Maybe somebody would say that you were dramatic. So these are all things which give us the inclination that maybe we should suppress these emotions. And so one of those markers of change is that we can feel and name and share our emotions and be okay. Number three is I can defend myself. My body will move when I need it to. Now, you see, one of the things that happens in trauma of all kinds, actually, of both of the kinds that I've mentioned, is that it's very, very common for our body to go into a freeze response. So we can go into fight or flight, but if it's a really overwhelming situation, our bodies can simply go into a freeze place. And that can make us feel even more helpless in that situation. It can actually make it more traumatic because the body's freeze response, while it's attempting to protect us so we feel less of what's going on in that moment, it also at the same time stops us from moving our body in ways that might have protected us. Now, it's a thing that the body does itself. It's not a choice that we've made even. But our bodies can go into freeze almost independently of what we would want. And so that sense that we can then carry that belief going forward that my body isn't going to protect me. I won't be able to defend myself. And so that's a marker of change as well. I can defend myself. My body will move when I need it to. When I have an impulse to move, I'm going to be able to move. Number four is I matter and my needs deserve to be met. Number five I'm safe and protected. Safety is my default state. Number six is I trust myself and I trust my intuition. Number seven is I have the power to overcome adversity and I have the power to make good things happen in my life. A little bit wordy this one. I'm struggling with the wording on that one. But it's really that we don't have that learned helplessness anymore. We don't see the futility. We actually believe in our ability to make the things happen that we would like to happen. There's a word for that which is called efficacy, but it's one of those kind of obscure words that not a lot of people know. So I'm, I'm trying not to say that one, but um, it basically means that we're not helpless anymore. If adversity comes, we have the confidence and, and belief in our own power to be able to solve the problem. And when we want something in our life, we have a trust in ourselves that we'll be able to do the things necessary to make those good things happen. So that's what I mean by number seven. I'll sort the wording out on that a little bit later and make it a little bit more economical, I suppose, and say it a bit more clearly. But hopefully you know what I mean by that now I've explained it. Number eight is I am not to blame. It's very common that we take responsibility for the awful thing that might have happened and think that maybe it was somehow down to us. And so a marker for change is that we really feel and know that it wasn't us that was to blame. Number nine is saving others is not my job. In situations that are not safe, we can often take responsibility for those around us. The, the thing becomes inversed and whereas it's maybe their job to look after us because we're only little, we take it upon ourselves that it's our job to look after others. And it can be very easy then to be always kind of sucked into everyone else's crisis and you end up not living your life at all. Now, that, of course, doesn't mean that you don't give help when it feels joyful for you to give help. But that sense of it's your job, it's your responsibility. You're the chief executive of everybody else's worries. And that's a job that you can never resign from. That's what I'm talking about there in terms of number nine. So a marker for change is to believe and feel that saving others is no longer your job. Number 10 is I am worthy of love. Now, it's very easy in a traumatic situation, especially if you're mistreated, to think that maybe that's down to you, that maybe you were mistreated because somehow you didn't deserve anything different. And so a real marker of change is to feel 
worthy of love, not just to know it intellectually, but to feel it in your bones that I am worthy of love. And of course, that brings it all that brings with it all sorts of things around safety. It also brings with it a security as well in terms of relationships, because when we know that we're worthy of love, we're not so scared of losing love within relationships. Number 11 is I am already enough. Now this goes again to that sense of doubt that we might have as to whether we are worthy. That sense that we're only worthy if we do certain things, if we achieve certain high standards. So a marker for change is that belief that I am already enough. It doesn't actually matter what we do, it doesn't matter what we achieve or not. Just the very fact that you are you means that you're already enough. Your worth is not dependent on how you are, what you do, what you achieve or don't. You are just simply, by definition of being you, already enough. And number 12 is I have hope for the future. It can be a common response to difficult experiences that have happened in the past that somehow this means that we're kind of damaged now, that we're kind of ruined and our futures are ruined. And so that belief in terms of having hope for the future is a key marker for change as well. Now, you'll notice some of these are kind of interlinked interlinked in some way. You know, the ability to defend yourself, the ability to overcome adversity, you know, the belief that you're safe as your default state. These things all weave into each other, don't they? And things around I'm worthy of love and I'm already enough and I have hope for the future. You know, these all, all kind of interweave as well as some of the others as well. But they're 12 separate things, which I think are a really useful way of thinking about how is it that we would know that we have recovered from this? What is it that we're aiming towards? And so we can use that almost as a checklist, like I say. And you might well notice as you go through the checklist that some of those you can already say and it'd be true. And if that's the case, well done, because it's It means that you've already done that work and you've already made some gains there. So that's great news. But you might find as well that there's certain things that you notice that are still outstanding for you, are still things that at this moment it wouldn't feel true to say and yet you recognise that If only you could get to a point where you actually believed this, like in your soul, that this would make a huge difference for you. So I'll just recap. First of all, I looked at trauma and the fact that I'm really interested in this as a therapist and I work with this a lot. And that in particular, I'm interested with what's sometimes called complex trauma, but basically means that repetitive trauma, the kind of normality of trauma that we might have grown up with. That's the kind of thing I am particularly interested in. And so in terms of looking at markers for change, what I've given here is 12 different markers for change. Because I think it's important that when we set out on change, whether we're doing it by ourselves or whether we're, you know, using a book or whether we're doing meditation or some other exercise or whether we're seeing a therapist like me that you have some sort of you have some sort of guide point as how do I know that this is actually working for me and so hopefully these 12 statements this can act as a checklist by which you can know the direction of travel that you're heading towards Get a real sense by reading them of what difference that would make for you if you got to that point of being able to say that thing and really believe it. But also, you'd be in a place where, you know, if I was coaching you, for instance, to run the marathon, we'd both know when you'd actually achieve that. We'd both know once you'd done that because I'd be able to watch you 
cross the finish line. And so this can act almost as a way of being able to tell that the work that we're doing together is actually working for you. So I hope this is useful. If it is, please pass it around. If you have any comments, of course, please contact me as well and let me know what you might add to this from your experience. You can contact me at info at alanparry.com. Just note that Alan is spelled the Welsh spelling, A-L-U-N. So that's info at alanparry.com. I'd really be interested to hear your reflections back on this, actually, because as I say, it's a bit of a work in progress that I've been working on uh, over the past couple of weeks. If you'd like to work with me directly, um, you can do, even if you're not based in Liverpool where I am because I work online. Just go to liverpoolpsychotherapy.co.uk and if you don't want to miss another episode of the podcast, then you can subscribe. It's completely free. So until the next one, thanks very much for listening and I'll see you next time.